Hello there. Today we're going to be talking about electric fields and Coulomb's law. So this is going to be largely uh, a, a recap of stuff that we've covered at uh, AS level. Uh, but then we're going to add in uh, some of the things that Coulomb's law tells us about uh, circular fields and things around point charges. So the idea here is to understand how electric fields form and their properties, as well as to be able to state and apply Coulomb's law. Um, and we're also going to be able to use fields to describe field strength. Um, and then we're going to go on to look at uh, electric potential in these fields as well. So just a quick recap on drawing electric fields. We have a couple of rules that we need to adhere to every time. The first is that field lines need to show the path that a massless, positively charged particle would follow. Um, it's important to this idea that the particles have to be massless um, because that means that they're very light, so they will actually follow that path. If you imagine that we had a heavy particle, um, it could uh, require extra force to make it uh, travel the true path. Um, so that's why we have a light, a light particle. Field lines never cross um, for the simple reason that if you think about it, if I'm following this path, it doesn't make sense for there to be a second path going that way. If I'm going from here to here, the idea of a field line is I shouldn't, if I start here, have to choose whether to go that way or that way. So it makes sense for them not to be able to cross. Um, and this isn't a hard and fast rule. You'll see um, examples of this where it doesn't happen. Um, but it's often easiest to think of a rule being that they usually enter and leave perpendicular to the surface that is producing them. Um, because that just makes it a little bit easy to understand. Qualitatively, you should get remember the idea that with any field line, the closer the field lines are, uh, the stronger the field is. So it's very simple. Um, they always go from positive to negative. So for two parallel plates like this, we will get them being uniformly distributed, which I'm doing a terrible job of drawing. Um, and we may get some spill over here at the sides. For two uh, solid particles like this, two spherical particles, again, if you just remember that you have to start perpendicular to the surface and go positive to negative, it's kind of impossible to draw this wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I literally have just drawn it wrong by letting them cross, but you very quickly get the idea of how these work. Um, one of the things uh, that you may want to be remember is that these fields' strength depend on the voltage between parallel plates, uh, and it also depends on the distance between them. Okay, and that's going to be the same for uh, radial fields. So again, just a quick uh, reminder for you. If I have a field between two parallel plates, um, you can see it's evenly spaced. And in this region around here, um, all the field lines are the same distance apart. So this is called a uniform field. That means the field is the same at all points. Um, these are not a true radial fields, but if I have a particle by itself, that's positive, I would draw the field lines going away from it like that. And this one would be a radial field. Um, this, but this, this one here is obviously the overlap between two different radial fields. So... Let's think about the electric field strength between two spheres. So here I've got two charged spheres, and I'm going to call them or give them charge Q1 and Q2. If you remember back from year 12, I, uh, AS level, uh, we know that we always measure charge in coulombs. Now, if you're switched on and you're thinking carefully about this, you might see a parallel here with gravity. For gravity, we've just said that the force between two massive objects is equal to the Cavendish constant of gravitation multiplied by the product of their two masses divided by the square of the distance between them. And if you think about these particles, well, um, I have a force, uh, electro an electric force is due to charge rather than mass, so it kind of makes sense that I'm going to have something where the force between the two of them due to electrostatic repulsion will have the product of their two charges, Q1 and Q2. 
And similarly, because we know that an individual charge by itself, just like a, a mass, will produce a radial field, I can say that it should probably be divided by r squared. That just stands to reason because, again, as I get further away, I'm going to spread the field out more. Um, but the slight difference here is the constant. Um, in gravity, we say this Cavendish constant is g. Uh, for charged objects, we use a constant of 4 pi epsilon naught. So we can say that the force on an object is equal to the product of their charges divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. So this epsilon naught, that is the permittivity of free space. So it's just a measure of how much it allows uh, an electric field to permeate through it. And what we'll be finding when we start to look at capacitors is that some objects have a different permittivity to others. So a vacuum, and the only thing you'll be asked to deal with at A level, will be epsilon naught. But there are materials that have different permittivity, hence why we include that in the, in the equation. OK, so let's turn now to think about electric field strength. Uh, so we can define gravitational field strength as the force due to gravity per kilogram of a mass. So it means if I have a one kilo object, it's how much force uh, is on that one kilo object. Uh, for electric field strength, we can define it as the force due to an electric field per coulomb of charge. So very simply, it has the symbol E, and that will be equal to the force on my object divided by its charge. So for uh, two parallel plates like this, you should remember that if they have the separation between them d, I can say that the force on a charged object is equal to the voltage on the plates divided by the distance between them multiplied by the charge on the object. So the electric field strength there is just simply the voltage on the plates or the potential difference between the plates divided by the distance between them. For a rate for two objects like this, it gets a little bit more complicated. I know that now from the previous slide that force is equal to Q1 Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And I'll call this one Q1. And what I'm going to say is that now I'm going to make this positive charge little q. Um, and little q here is going to be my test charge. So I can say that electric field strength is force on my little test charge. So here I'm going to say that the force between the two is Q1. And now I've replaced Q2 with this small q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. So therefore E becomes big Q, little q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, and that just simplifies to q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, which you should recognize is very, very similar to gravitational field strength. So in summary for this little section, uh, for fields due to point charges, which are kind of like radial fields, we can say that electric field strength is q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, and the force between them is q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. If you have them due to parallel plates, which forms a uniform field, then I can say that electric field strength is just voltage divided by distance, and the force on them is the charge on my object multiplied by voltage divided by distance between them. OK, so now let's turn our attention to potential, or the energy required to get somewhere in a field. So we're going to start off nice and simply and think about the field due to two plates. So we know that the electric field between two plates is equal to the voltage across those plates uh, divided by the distance between them. So if here's plate 1, which I'm going to make positive, here's plate 2, which I'm going to make negative, then what I'm saying is that here's my D and V is the potential difference or the voltage between them. Now if you notice, both D and V are constants here. So if I have a test charge, positive test charge, it is going to be repelled from the positive and attracted to the negative, but the size or the magnitude of that repulsion is going to be exactly the same wherever it goes. Um, because of that, 
when I come to try and say the force on it, again I can see that the force only depends on the work, sorry, on the uh, charge of my test object uh, and the voltage on the plates and distance between them. It doesn't, uh, the force doesn't vary with position, it's always the same magnitude. So what I can say then is let's think about the work done moving from one plate to another. So if I want to go from over here to over here, what is the work done? Well, I know that work done is equal to the integral of force with respect to distance. Now, in this case, force isn't changing. So it's a really simple equation, and I can just simplify that too. For this instance, work done is equal to force multiplied by distance. And even if you're not happy with calculus, you should be able to remember that for a constant force, work done is just force times distance. So I said for this uh, or yellowy orange blob that I just put in, that it's travelling from one plate to another. So in this case, x is the distance. So I can say that the work done is force times distance d. And if I substitute that back into the equation, I know that force is qv over d. So I'm just multiplying out by d, and you can see that this just simplifies out. I get rid of the uh, d's, and I can say that work done on a test charge is equal to q times v. Um, and that actually is where we get our definition of what voltage is. We can say that voltage is just the work done per coulomb of charge. And if you remember way, way, way back, oops, I don't know how I've just done that. I have no idea how I did that, that's cool. If you remember way, way, way back to GCSE, that is even the GCSE definition of what voltage is. Voltage or potential difference is the work done per coulomb of charge. Um, so really, what is voltage? Again, we can think of it as the difference in electrical potential between two points. Um, if we think about a simple circuit, and you'll see a similar diagram to this in your textbook, if it has three identical resistors and a 12 volt supply, what I'm saying is between here and here, I will have four joules of energy between it for every coulomb of charge as it travels through there. That's really all potential difference is. Okay. So let's take the slightly harder case and think about the potential in a radial field. Um, so what I said earlier is that voltage is equal to, oh this is a mistake here, sorry, work done is equal to the integral of force with respect to x. But I also said up here that voltage is, or potential, is work done per coulomb. Um, so I'm just going to put that up here for later. Potential is equal to work done or potential difference per coulomb. So I'm just going to change that V to a W. That will make more sense. So I want to have the idea of a test charge somewhere. And I'm going to move it from infinity, so from a, uh, an infinite distance away, to a point in my field. Uh, exactly the same as I did uh, before. Now this time R is my distance so I'm going to rewrite this as force is equal to Q1, Q2, sorry um, work done is equal to the integral of Q1, Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared but this time I'm integrating with respect to R. And I have to do it with respect to R because my field strength does change. Because of this R term, if here's my point charge, if I go from here to here, I have changed my field strength because my field strength directly depends uh, on the force, uh, sorry, on the distance between my objects. So again, I'm going to say here's Q1. And here's Q2, which is my test charge. And I want the idea of taking it from infinity 
to this point. Now, with gravitational fields, we said that the work done is always going to be negative because I'm always, because gravitational fields are always attractive, whatever my mass is, I'm always going to be falling towards my object. But hopefully you can see here, if I have a positive test charge and I'm going towards a positive charge, I'm having to overcome the repulsion between them. So I'm not going to get a negative symbol appearing this time. So just doing an integration quickly. If you're not comfortable with following this integration, that's absolutely fine. Um, you don't need it for your IGCS. Sorry, for your A level. So insulting. Um, you're just gonna. Uh, you can just play along um, and just follow it and just get to the result. You don't need to actually know it. Um, what I'm going to do, just to make life a little bit easier for me, I'll just make the, just simplify some of the equations is I'm going to use a little trick that you might see, and it's useful to talk about it now. Uh, what I'm going to say is that I'm going to create a constant called k, which is equal to 1 divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. Um, and sometimes you will see that used in textbooks online and stuff. Now, CIE don't tend to use it, um, but just when you, for your own notes, especially you use Z notes, I think Z notes sometimes use it, you might want to be aware of this. So if I use that as k, I can rewrite this integral as work done is equal to the integral of q1, q2 multiplied by k uh, over r squared. Now I took some advice from, uh, sorry, with integral integrated with respect to r, uh, and I let's put some limits in, so I'm going to my point r in the distance between them, and I'm starting off at infinity. Um, now, uh, Mr. Cartwright pointed out that um, you have mostly will have been taught to do integration this way. So the first thing I'm going to do uh, is remove my constants from my integration. So it's now going to look like this. Uh, yep. Uh, is that right? Yep. That's looking reasonable at any rate. Um, and it's going to be our, just going to simplify it to negative 2 dr, and that just integrates then to q1, q2, k, and then that becomes r to the negative 1 dr, um, and I'm going to get a minus 1 on the outside of that. Oh, well, don't need that dr anymore, I've got rid of that. Um, and I'm going between r and infinity. Um, so I can simplify this now to say, uh, let's expand this out, I get minus q1 q2 k multiplied by uh, 1 over infinity minus 1 over r. Um, now, 1 over infinity, that is equal to 0. So I get minus q1, q2, k, lots of 0 minus 1 over r. And thank God I got rid of the negative sign. I was worried it was going to stick around. So the, the, when I multiply a negative by a negative, I get a positive. So I get q1, q2 times this constant over r. And just for the heck of it, I'm going to get rid of my constant, and I'm going to get q1, q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r. And you should notice a real similarity here uh, with gravitational fields. There's one step left to do. I've asked for potential. Uh, potential um, is work done per unit charge. So the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say that potential is this work done divided by the charge of my test charge? So I'm just going to divide this. If I say this, was, I said this was Q2, um, so it's just going to become divide by Q2. So it would just be Q1 by itself over 4 pi epsilon naught r. So here, there you have it. By thinking of that, what I can say is that if I have this test charge all by its lonesome here, I can work out how or what the electric potential will be at any point. All I need to know is the charge of my object and the distance from it. 
uh, you can see it's not negative because in this instance I'm going from infinity towards it and we always consider it as a positive test charge so it will always require energy to go towards it. So um, I just want to talk very briefly because we will go through this more in the lesson and in your examples is the best way of learning this. Um, but just thinking about electric field strength again and start to think about multiple points. So one of the questions they might ask you is here's one charge, here's a second charge, um, and here's a third charge. And it's and generally they'll be in um, just one dimension. They don't tend to get uh, two dimensional because you have to start doing horrible calculus. But they're going to say I travel from infinity, so from over here and I travel to that point. What's the work done on a positive test charge? And you can see that could get quite complicated. Um, so a nice easy thing to remember is electric field strength can be found as the diff as the gradient, so it's dv by dd. So what that means is if I have uh, a potential and a distance um, and I find that for most radial fields it's going to look like this. Um, what you may have to do in an exam is work out the gradient at a point, so you can just do that graphically by drawing a tangent, um, and then you're going to be using that to find electric field strength, and uh, that should be minus negative in there, um, to find electric field strength. Now the reason that we do that um, is because what you're going to find when you do these examples is that finding this curve here is often much easier um, for multiple charges. So if you do do this, what you can say is that E total is equal to the electric field strength of the first object plus electric field strength of the second plus electric field strength of the third. So this will have an E1 this will have a component E2, and this one will have a component E3. And what we'll find is that adding those up is actually quite simple, um, but a very, very powerful way um, of finding these things. But I'll wait until we've done some examples with that. Okay, I think you've earned a break. I think I've definitely earned a break. One thing I would recommend, the textbook, uh, uncharacteristically, is actually quite good at doing some explanations here. Um, so in your CIE uh, A-level physics textbook, I would recommend that you read through chapter 23 um, in its entirety. It's not too long, um, and it does provide some nice worked examples especially. Do check the worked examples. Um, those are, again, surprisingly pretty good. And I'll see you in our lesson.